you have to have courage, you know, and uh, continue to try. Because if yeah. you stop, if you stop trying, well, then you don't even have the opportunity at the joy. You don't even have the opportunity at mattering. That's right. And and you know, then the whole thing gets thrown away. And then what are you even doing here? So I have an inferiority complex. Like I grew up in your shadow. You know, you're like this genius, gifted artist, and. Um, you know, ever since we were children, everybody was looking at your stuff and saying, oh my gosh, look at this guy, you know, he's, you know, he's only X years old and he's, you know, performing at whatever level, you know, and so I always was like, man, I just want to be recognized and trusted for my creativity. And I never really believed in myself as creative or as like having anything to offer until I, until I left Arizona and I moved out to Los Angeles you know, and then when I got to Los Angeles, I saw myself in a a new light, like against a totally different background, a totally unfamiliar background that was unlike me. And then all of these people that didn't know me, you know, they kept saying to them, to me, they kept repeating like, oh, wow, you're so creative. Oh, this is so cool. You're so, right. And then all of a sudden, like when I got out on my own, I was like, oh my goodness, like maybe I really do have something here. It's possible. I've, I've really been thinking about this lately. It's possible that all of, our whole family had that same experience. I think that Pete also felt like he was living in my shadow. And I think it's possible that James, you know, I feel like I should just go to all of my brothers and just get an honest answer. Did you feel like you were living in my shadow? Did you feel like I was a favorite? I think I was treated like a favorite. I don't I don't think that I'm literally the favorite, but I think I was treated that way. And well, you maybe, know, it's also not your responsibility as to how you were treated, you know? Like those are just the right, circumstances. Right. This is not to dig up a sad story but to gain understanding, you know. Well, uh, and so that yeah, so there's a there's a um there's a saying that that goes that, that uh, comparison is a thief of joy. Man, that's a good saying. And uh, you know, for for me to compare myself constantly to you in a creative realm over the years uh, was perhaps robbing me of any joy in my own creativity. You know, and so it was when I got out into a different environment and when I switched, when I got my own medium, this is what was huge. Like, this is kind of why I got into filmmaking is because none of my other brothers were touching it. You know, like I didn't want to try and be a painter. You know, I didn't want to try and be a writer because my brothers were better painters and were better writers. And I didn't want to be a musician. I didn't, I wasn't pursuing a professional music career anymore because my brothers were more talented musicians so I switched mediums. I was like, you know, comparison, yeah, film cameras and computers. Like that's something that I can do that none of them are doing, and so there's no comparing. It's a totally different language, you know. And then when I stopped trying to compare myself, is kind of when it started to blossom within me, like I guess my own confidence and maybe my own joy in making stuff, you know, because there was no, like, here's what I made. Well, is it, how's it look next to my very talented brothers? There, none of that happened. You know, it was just, here's what I made and people liked it, you know? And so, yeah, the only thing I was comparing my work to was really just the approval of the people that were paying me to do it. Yeah. Which is healthy, you know? We were having very different experiences growing up. They are very different. And so I was I was spending a lot of time inside myself. I I was for the most part trying to stay in a bubble when I was growing up. Because I didn't match up to to uh society standards and I, I wasn't cool like the other guys. And I I was a 
bit emotionally traumatized by school. Not extremely. I don't, you know, it's not it's not a sob story, but a bit emotionally traumatized. I think if you're I human, wasn't, you're a bit emotionally traumatized by the public school system. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's not so unique. I, uh, I'm I'm still confused uh, about how some things were allowed to happen, but then I realize that uh my kids are probably going to say the same stuff there's just so many things in the busyness of life that you can't blame anybody for it happening it's it's just that things go, get under the radar one of those things was that that i had a pe teacher that would give me an f every single pe class because i wouldn't get all the way naked for showers yeah i, I and remember that, that. was yeah. yeah, and we're talking like and, '90s, early '90s. Yeah, and I was not secure with my body. I, I, it traumatized me to to think of being fully naked in front of the other boys. That, and then I, I had this strange skin acne uh, trouble that was like from my waistline down. So if I got all the way naked, it was quite a spectacle. And and so other kids in the locker room uh, would would. I look and say, what is that? What is that? all?" And, you know, that's traumatizing when you're a kid. You don't have the security to just say, everybody's got problems. Here's mine. Yeah. Big deal. And yeah. just answer the question plainly because now I'm not ashamed. If, you know, in, uh, in our 40s, we're not ashamed. If someone asks us a question about our appearance, our body, you know, I'd, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, I... Uh, it was really nose, weird. What's my going nose on, man? A <laughs> hey, check this out. You're going to want to have a look at this. Yeah, my face is crooked. I'm not symmetrical. I'm weak. I'm small. You know, yeah, big right. deal. I'm ignorant. I fail yeah. a lot. I can't get my yeah. foot out of my mouth. You know? The shame is gone. But when you when you're a child growing up, okay. So this is all leading to a point. I'm just saying, you know, for context. I, I was growing up really trying to hide from that that trauma, and and so I I was I was failing at at being like the other boys at school and it was really scary if somebody wanted to pick on me there were mean kids where we grew up in in uh, ohio and so i would just run out into the fields uh, and escape reality every single day i I was a nature boy i loved nature and so my happy place was drawing a picture and showing it to our dad or our mom and, you know, Terry, uh, dad's friend, Terry Toole, who who uh, he's passed away now, but but he uh, was someone I really loved to impress. He was a great, those, those adults were a great encouragement in my life. Dude, he <clears throat> took me on a motorcycle ride on the back of his motorcycle through the, the uh, neighborhood. I like that was such a beautiful experience as like a 10 year old, you know. <laughs> I remember that about yeah. Terry. Yeah. He was so fun, you know, just su such a fun person. Hanging out. He just wanted to have fun and and it was contagious. He was he would make you laugh. He was funny. His humor was was good. And so I lived for those moments. I just lived for them. So my day to day, I was my sanctuary was an empty field in nature just trying to explore stuff that was my sanctuary and then my uh fuel for for life to feel good about myself was drawing pictures and saying look what i did and when i learned that i had a knack for it i just stayed in that place you know it never really occurred to me that maybe one of the reasons i stayed so long in that focused place focusing on artwork is is not because I said, I want to create, I want to create, create, create. I want to be an expert drawer. I want to get better at drawing. I think that it was my happy place of escape. It was my world where I was safe and where I was somebody and, and I was creating. You know, when you create, when you, when you create, you're, you exist. You, it, that's just how it goes. Well, you know, you... Uh... You got me thinking about it now, like, you know, 
the 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 motivation for me to make stuff is like if I'm really being honest about it, it's not it's not about having a profession or a career or any amount of success, you know? Like I'm going to die broke and with nothing, you know? Like I mean that's just how everybody does, you know? You can't take stuff with you, so who cares about building up some mountain of something now, you know? Yeah. Um so we're real- such philosophers. None, none of us can escape. I've talked to all of us. All all the brothers have that same view. And, and none of us can escape that nagging reality. Do you really want to just work for money? <laughs> we're all just so appalled well, we, by that thought. Yeah, well, we grew up broke, right? Like I was telling yeah. somebody the other day, we used to get in trouble for drinking too much milk as children because we were burning through so much milk. Our parents were like, well, we, I can't afford a gallon of milk every day, you know? <laughs> Yeah, right. It's true. Yeah. So the real reason, you know, that I make stuff is not for prosperity or career success. Like the real reason is because I was in the middle of all these boys. You know, there were five of us. There were there were three above me and one below me in age. You know, the younger one was was uh, was cuter. You know, was like more. Uh, endearing the older ones were more talented were more you know grown you know and and just like age wise i was right in the middle my oldest brother is six years older than me my youngest brother is was six years younger and so there i was in the middle of all of these people and with like limited parenting because there were five of us and we were just running all over the place like how you gonna keep track of five boys you know in, in uh in that time and so what really i was hungry for like you say you were hungry for like finding this happy place i was hungry to be heard you know to like be seen to be recognized to like to matter to not just be invisible and and yeah okay yeah yeah that's different ever since like when we made music you know back in the day the kind of music we made, I was just screaming into the microphone, my thoughts and feelings, you know, like, hear me, listen, like just desperation to like, to be recognized, you know, like to matter, to not be invisible, you know, and to this day, that is what motivates me as a full grown 42 year old man, I still just have this craving to matter to something somewhere. You know, and uh, to not be invisible. It's like that's just the that's the most that's the most sinking feeling to me is to just be lost in a crowd and not matter. But like in a way, that's like a reality that I have to come to grips with. Because really, I am just one more iteration of a human being in the midst of billions. Yeah. You know? Or, or I don't know, 300 million or I don't know how many human beings there are right now. It's yeah, it's not my line of expertise to know these things. But like that's a reality right, I hear what that, you're saying. Yeah. that, that, that mm, I have yeah. to reckon with. And that's the push-pull is like, it's like, gosh, man, like I'm, I want my voice. I, I want to, I want to understand that the reason I care so much about life is because my voice matters. Like I, yeah. I, I really am desperate to believe that to be true. You know, and that's, and then there's the reality that, well, I'm temporary and I will be forgotten. In time, you know, like in a hundred years, who cares who I was? In a thousand, it's like, who even existed back then? Who knows, right? So there's this reality of my insignificance. That just kind of haunts me and motivates me to just like make stuff that that catches people's attention, that grabs their ear, that engages that audience and makes them see me, you know? Yeah. Like, like it's my ego just on 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 eleven, you know, like I I'm just like, see me, I matter, please, but you know, acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah, when you, when a person creates something, I'm convinced that the heart of creative motivation is to exist we like you said you want you want to feel like you are 
seen, noticed. I, I just believe at our very core is a need to be appreciated in in some way and to be acknowledged that we exist. All those experiences. You know, how bad does it feel to fall and get hurt and look around and nobody saw it? How bad does that feel? It's like the worst kind of injury. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, you're experiencing pain that only exists for you. <laughs> it's a bad, bad alone feeling. I remember swinging. Remember, uh, there was a little, little uh, Ricky down on the corner of the street next to the railroad tracks. And I uh, couldn't find anybody. I knocked on doors. No one could come out play. So... I went to little Ricky's house down the street and there was a rope swing and I grabbed a stick off the ground and thought it was clever to push myself off the trunk of the tree uh, on the rope swing. And then I thought, I'm going to catch myself. Now you can see where this is going. I put this big stick in front of me as I swung down toward the tree. I guess I wasn't a student of physics at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I'm a, I kicked off the tree, I'm coming back toward it, and I'm like, I'm going to stop it with the stick. It just plows into my stomach. <laughs> and I just crumble off the swing to the ground. Yeah. Doing one of these. Eh, I think eh, everybody eh, knows that feeling. <laughs> 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 I can only breathe out, not in. I can't speak. Yeah. And I'm looking around. Wondering if help's gonna go. No help. Nobody. No sound. Just me. It's, I'm just curled up on the ground, uh, suffering the consequences of my actions. <laughs> and so the the humor. I just <clears throat> I get a kick out of it now. Now the first thing I wanted to do was to go to where there's people and tell what just happened to me because I want to exist. I want this. <laughs> I want that to matter. I don't want to feel. Uh, and and go through these things without it being a story that exists. So at our core, at our core is that need to exist. When you create, it's a way of getting what's in you out on on a table that others can see, so that you're seen, and well, that feels good about. Yeah, it. yeah. I mean that's true, but you know, like that wasn't necessarily why you got in your reps. You know, it's it's easy to it's easy to understand that if you want to be great at a skill, you got to get in your reps. You know, you yeah. got to you got to do it a lot. Put in that's, the hours. That's not novel. You know, to be a a skillful artist, you got to do yeah. it a lot. You know, make a lot of things yeah. that suck. And you know, yeah, right. over and over and over yeah. and over. Yeah. Until you true. until you subjectively can do stuff that that people like, right? So, but that's not why you did it, right? You were doing it because it was a, a place of calm, uh, a sanctuary, because yeah. the alternative was very uncomfortable and perhaps painful, and that's why that's right. I was doing yeah. it. I was also doing it because uh, I wanted a place that felt calm. And was a sanctuary from the pain and the reality of not mattering. You know, like it's like I think both of us are making stuff voraciously because of this addressing of uh, an insecurity or like a, a discomfort in the alternative state of being. You know? Yeah. So it's not like a. It's not like we desire to make stuff. It's that we desire to not feel so badly, you know? And like, this is the antidote. I'd probably put like a, I'd probably put a happier spin on my experience and, and say, I get a high out of it. I like that good feeling when I'm just creating. I want to see the well, creature yeah, here, right. colors. Well, yeah, just yeah. like, just like, you know, when someone says, oh, you know, dude, you know, that's really cool. I love how you, right? I'm just like, oh, they see me, right? And there's, you know, the dopamine rush, you know, you, you're like. Yeah. yeah. And, but then there's also, all right, so that's one, that's a good point you make. That's one motivator is yeah. the response from yeah. an audience. Mm -hmm. Another motivator is the soothing of some insecurity. 
right? That's another yeah. that's another motivator. Yeah, like a medicine, like a, like a medicine to address feeling bad. And yeah. then a, you run. and then a third motivator is just that it's really fun to do, right? It just tickles your brain yeah. when when the things click, when it aligns, when something emerges from what you're making. And you're like, oh, look how this fits with this. And when I put it together, you get this interesting new effect, you know? Yeah, entertain is nothing but a, a fun, entertaining moment. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a bit reductive, I think, to just say that, you know, we make stuff for this reason. Like, it's really, it's really touching on a lot of, it's motivated by a lot of different factors. Yeah. Well, who's the who's the villain in Harry Potter? Who's the main villain? In <laughs> Voldemort. There you Voldemort. go. Voldemort. Yeah. Voldemort with the T. Voldemort. Sure. Well, Voldemort. if you get it wrong, well, yeah, yeah. Probably... Voldemort. No, was... I think I said he's the, he's the ugly face without a proper nose. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he puts there's a name for it, but it's it's like a a part of himself in each of of these various characters, and for Harry Potter to defeat him he has to defeat each of these existences where he spread himself out he can't he can't be defeated until every part of him that he's distributed is gone and then the real clincher is that one of those is in harry potter himself at the end so harry potter actually has to die in order to destroy this last piece of Voldemort. and i thought man what a cool concept uh just because i think Again, at the our core, we uh, we have empathy. We vicariously live through others' joy. When you love another person, a part of you begins to exist and depend on their well-being and not yours. Yeah. And so you're spreading yourself out, but it's not like in the movie where you become weaker as you're spread thinner. No, it's like planting a new seed of yourself in a person. And I would say that this discovery for me happened mostly through fatherhood. Uh, the joy of being helpful to another person for the sake of their joy. For the sake of their joy, not for the sake of, of, um, you know, there are many other things. You could have many motivations for helping something. But this is something that is really valuable because you can, you can actually interpret the way this world is being one of the billions and trillions as only having greater and greater opportunity to plant seeds of joy. You know, you, you invest yourself in other people's outcomes. And it's, it's, it'd be, I think that you become less breakable, more able to feel without being destroyed, more whole, more complete. You, I really believe that this is the formula to joy is loving uh, as much as you can love others so that your personal outcomes are insignificant. But, you know, like investing in many stocks, there's there's going to be good outcomes that thoroughly bring you joy because you're invested in them. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking this, right? So you don't matter until you matter to something else, right? I, I think of it this way saying, think of it this way okay so if you have an object right thinking like physics right so you have an object and it exists in a space with no other objects with nothing else it has no relation to anything right it's just one thing in the midst of nothing right okay that object doesn't really matter to anything else right that that object is just its own one thing and when it when it comes nothing cares when it goes nothing cares yeah I just now you have an object in the midst of a whole bunch of other objects right you have one gumball in the midst of a gumball machine that's full of hundreds of gumballs well now that one gumball is in relation to all those other gumballs 
it takes up space. Other gumballs have to move around in order to make space for it, right? Yeah. Now yeah. it yeah. affects other things. It has relationship to other things. It's not just about the one thing in space. It's about it affecting other things, mattering to other things. Now that one thing matters. And if you think about us as that object and you think about the rest of beings and existence as the other objects within this gumball machine, we'll call it, you matter when you matter to other things. That's why it's such a losing game for me to just try and exert my own ego and try and do it loud enough and forceful enough that suddenly I matter. Well, because my focus is just inward. It's just on the one thing. I'm trying to fortify that one thing and not considering anything else around. Yeah, That's just a right. fast track to exhaustion and dying without mattering. Yeah. But like you were saying, and being a father, well, now all of a sudden you got other gumballs in the situation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, now yeah. You, what you do and how you are and, and how you behave, it affects the other beings around you. Yeah. And you have just an obvious and instant sense of mattering, even though, you know, you're not going to be here for long. You know, you're going to go and then other things will come and replace you and then you'll be forgotten and other yeah. things will happen, right? But you did matter, you know? That's true, yeah. Permanence, yeah. Is, permanence is not mattering, you know? It's, it's influence that makes us matter. Society can, can lead us the opposite way, can, can pull us away from this very satisfying route that you're talking about society can can just nag and nag especially in the commercial world where we're inundated with ads that are appealing to you you doing you yeah are you getting what you want are you getting satisfied are you getting what you deserve well the you know the like you were you use the phrase fast track the fast track to getting frustrated in life I would say is make sure you deserve a lot and uh, make sure that your your main goal is to conform the world to what you want it to be. You know? Yeah. <laughs> try and, try and control stuff. Yeah. Try and yeah. control stuff yeah. and deserve a lot. Yeah, that's the fast track to misery. Misery, yeah. I would have said the exact same words, fast track to misery. And, and so in my creative journey, uh, you know, the the focus on on the joy of helpfulness has has been like the getting away from that mentality in work. You know, nobody nobody really likes having hard work imposed on them, especially when it's in the form of you're never going to amount to anything if you don't learn to work harder, son. You know, that feels really bad. But me being able to reframe the idea of work as the meaning, it work was what I was doing when I was in my bubble, finding joy and drawing a dragon that's destroying all of the bad guys on my church church bulletin, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the that was work, and it was just you know as the work that I I it was working toward what I wanted to do well that life. makes me that makes me think you know like if you approach your creative career or like any job you have if you approach it as like i deserve certain conditions i deserve a certain paycheck you know i require this i want that like that's one way to approach a job but then when you don't get all those things you're going to hate your job you know yeah but if you think of it yeah. instead as an opportunity to help somebody you know that like has a need you know, some some company has some need and it's your opportunity to matter by helping them. Like, well, that's a joy. All of a sudden it's a joy, you know? Yeah. And that's yeah. The, like, it just completely shifts your motivation to do really hard work. Like, like if I'm going to, if I have a job to do, if I have a job to do and it's, and I'm and I'm coming at it like, man, I'm I'm a director 
right? Like I've been at this for 15 years. Like I, I need respected. I need a chair with my name on it. You know, I need shade from the sun. I want a little fan that cools me off. I want assistance, you know, because this is how I operate. This is, you know, if you want this genius, you're going to have to create this cultivating environment for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is so many people. You know, like you wouldn't believe, like I live in Los Angeles. That is so many people. So many. And I feel myself going that way in frustrated moments. You know, I, I'm not above it. It's human nature. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, and so I'm gonna to I'm gonna crash off. and burn with that attitude, you know? And it'll and maybe I'll maybe I'll deliver excellence for whatever client, maybe, you know, but I'll probably hate the process and I'll probably burn out, you know, and I'll probably be jaded. You know, and just be a drag to be around. But then on the flip side, if you come at it and you're like, oh man, well, there's this, this company and they've got this new product or, or there's this, this writer who's got this script and, and they've got this message that they just really need the world to hear in a really poignant way. And I have been entrusted, right? They've, they've, for some reason, some stroke of luck or whatever, you know, like I get to be the one that, that gets a shot at this. And I get to help them, you know, they've, they've come to this key to turn their lock, you know, like if I consider it an opportunity to just help them, you know, all of a sudden it's like, I'm full of humility and gratitude and I'm happy while I'm doing it. And like, who cares if it's too hot or if it's too cold or if I'm hungry or if I've been working for 12 hours going on 57 hours that week, right? Who cares, you know, because there's just so much joy in having an, an opportunity to do work that solves a problem for somebody else and makes their life better. You know, right. it's yeah, it like it makes your engine stop running on sludge and now you're running on high octane fuel, man. Yeah, that's true. And in, in your your joy level at the end of that day is is so much more more complete it feels so much better yeah like if it's somebody that you're sitting next to on a bench or if it's somebody with a bunch of money trying to hire you to do something big and cool to challenge this very fluffy view okay someone might argue yeah you go out in the public you be helpful and guess what Somebody uses the money you give them to destroy their own life and buy alcohol. Somebody uh, takes the help that you gave. They never come back to say thank you. They end up being a crummy person. And you're just perpetuating the, the faults of humanity. I think those are valid hang-ups with helpfulness and kindness. Yeah, so you can voluntarily try and help someone, give everything you've got to solve their problem, and they end up being a narcissist or they end up being... Uh, you know, manipulate. Completely unthankful. Yeah, completely unthankful. And Entitled even even more so, let's say that you just create a brat. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so you don't get joy in that respect. So you've touched on something very important, and this is absolutely the case. It is very risky to love. It is very risky. Period. Because Blanket statement. Risky to love. It is. Yeah. Because when you extend that vulnerability and that care, I'm somebody that cares a lot, right? I have a problem. I care a lot about a lot. And it just is overwhelming, right? Yeah. Like my own mom, she gave me advice. I was weeping on the phone once while I was talking to her mom. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, mom, such I'm a like, soft person. Yeah. I'm like, oh my goodness, mom is, oh, it's so hard. And it's yeah. just, I'm being crushed and I'm being taken advantage. Yeah. And her advice was, well, maybe try and care less, you know? And, and I was like, <laughs> man, what? <laughs> like yeah, that's, throw you that's a virtue or <laughs> that can be like a solution. Yeah. Well, the point, uh -huh. the point is, is that, it, it makes you very vulnerable and it's very risky to be so passionate and to care and to like give yourself uh, without restraint to, to something else, you know? And yeah, you will often get kicked and abused and neglected and forgotten, taken advantage of. So yeah, it's not a guarantee that, that 
sacrifice for another's well-being yields joy, you know? But that's the risk you have to take if you want a chance at that joy. And when you get crushed, it takes a whole lot of like maturity and um, ability to, to accept that people are flawed and people will hurt you. Yeah. And to, to understand that this world is not flowery and full of just roses. It's full of a lot of really dark and difficult things as well. Yeah. And, and so it becomes a matter of courage to accept that risk, you know, and to continue to be vulnerable and to continue to love and to try. You know, you said something to me once that I'll never forget. You said, I like people that try. You probably true. don't remember saying Still that. Still true. But <laughs> I don't remember the, the conversation, but I, I was... Well, I was really bummed out because I was trying really hard at, at trying to be a, a an employed artist, you know, and I wasn't getting anywhere. And the only consolation you could get, you couldn't tell me, well, you know, you'll you'll get there, you know, you'll you'll just keep chiseling away at that stone and it'll become a diamond, you know, because that's not a guarantee. Like you're saying, right? Like, that's... Yeah. That's other people. You know, those We're are trying to be that, honest here. Yeah. So the constellation you gave me as well, I see that you're trying a lot and you know, you like people that try. That's so <laughs> it sounds so bad. When you say that. <laughs> no. Your, your reiteration of the conversation is humorously bad discouraging. Well, I like people that try and you're doing that, so that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, yeah, I, I think I think it's just. I don't disagree. Ad, I think it's great. It's great, but it's it's an it's admission. Like it's an admission that you don't control the outcomes of your work. You know, yeah. you just have to have yeah. you have to have courage. You know, and uh, continue to try. Because if yeah. you stop, if you stop trying, well, then you don't even have the opportunity at the joy. You don't even have the opportunity at mattering. That's right. And, and, you know, then the whole thing gets thrown away. And then what are you even doing here? What I think is true grit is the ability to keep being kind, knowing, knowing that this is the hostile environment. So when I see somebody, I, I'm an admirer of a man's man with good muscles and ability to do uh, sports, you know, that athleticism, physical ability, uh, emotional command, come into a room and be the boss. I mean, these are like super manly qualities that, that didn't come real naturally to me that I admired and looked up to since I was a kid. And, and, and uh, who doesn't like superheroes? Uh, y you know, and so I'm, <clears throat> I'm speaking for myself. I, I know that there's a woman's version of that. You know, I'm, I know that that there are all different kinds of superheroes we look up to. But, but my suggestion is that uh, the true grit is n not in those great abilities that I look to on the surface, but really is in the kind person that is well aware, well aware that the world is going to return hostility for kindness and still is able to choose kindness over and over again. That is an amazing amount of grit, in my opinion, that is more valuable than any other kind of stick to as people say. You know, it, it's better than any kind. The ability to continue extending kindness when hostility is being given back is a true test of a great person in my opinion when you're growing up you have time to try out different faces different fronts different fake versions of you because the main goal is approval you're just trying to be cool like the other things we've we've talked about and man i just feel like i tried all kinds of different versions of myself and uh you know what i was after was was importance in, you know, the virtue of being a great person. And where 
where I found the straight path toward those qualities is in the very simple process of learning to love others and be kind. Uh, it is <clears throat> so simple and so hard. And like I said, I admire people that try. And when I see a kind person, I see a person trying hard because it's not easy. Guess what, all of you mean people out there? Kindness is really, really hard. You're not demonstrating strength when you abuse. That is not a demonstration. Yeah, on the contrary, <laughs> that's that's like fear and insecurity run yeah. rampant. And that's what that is. Yeah. No, I, if you really want to, you know, I, I like to use, uh-oh, I just realized I am a Cornelius going into analogy mode. I'm going to keep this brief. Okay. Go. In my mind, calloused skin is tough. I would describe it as tough. And it has high resistance to abuse. But it is not sensitive and does not accomplish work. Muscles are extremely sensitive. A little electrical shock just makes a big muscle pulse like crazy, sends it out of control. It is that very sensitivity that makes a muscle what I would describe as strong and not, not tough, meaning it can accomplish work and help people with things. So I, I uh, would like parallel my best version that I want to be you know, the, the person I want to be, I want to be a strong person, sensitive and able to accomplish good things. Yeah. Sensitive and resilient. Like yeah, if you yeah. can, if it's you can tough. couple, if thing. you can, yeah, to be the muscle and the callus, you know? Yeah. And then if you can have both on demand, wow, you're super duper. Yeah. So the creative process is a sensitive one and it's hard to be sensitive Hard to be sensitive and make yourself vulnerable and kind and do these, but but I feel like that's where the road points is is learning how to be that person. Yeah, yeah, it takes it it absolutely takes both and and in balance too, you know, because if you're if you're all sensitivity, if you're all caring, if you're all kindness, if you're all love, but have no resilience, you have no calluses. You have no ability to accept the difficulties and the the ugly underbelly of humanity that will yeah. show you hostility. Yeah. Well, then then you're just gonna get crushed. And you're gonna quit. Right. You're gonna hate it. You know. You're gonna you're gonna go somewhere quieter and more peaceful without these yeah. threats. Yeah. You reach that point in life where the world's not working right, and it's not your fault because you didn't make the world. And so you are in a state of waiting for the world to change. That's why I don't love that song. You know, I don't want to wait on the world to change. I want to be the change. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, or at least my ideal, my ideal is that I am the change. And I, I don't like the way it looks on a person when, when they identify that they have problems, but they just want to stay there and have the world give them outs. You know, I, I was a pretty hard dad for that reason. You know, when my kids wanted to self-diagnose with every new dysfunction that's showing up on the internet, you know, my, my response was, okay, the next step is to man up, look yourself in the mirror and say, are you going to do something about it or not? You know that that's it, <clears throat> and yeah, it's so, it's yeah. easy it's easy not to discount anything that your kids may have gone through, but like it's easy to be in a victim mentality. Like it's easy to be in pain, and then to have that pain be the explanation as to why you stop caring or trying. It's genuinely hard. I mean, I I've been in that state enough, and for all I know, I'll enter it again tomorrow, but. The, the thing that I've noticed is that it is, it is just waiting. That moment just stays there until you do the work to get out. You just, you know, if you live your life waiting for 
some circumstance around you to to start acting right then you're in a in a recipe for destruction that's it you know yeah it's been said by someone much smarter than me that there are three things that uh, all humans must reckon with and that is pain uncertainty and the necessity to work for one's survival man work is so valuable isn't it frustrating that all of our deepest thoughts have already been thought and we're just finding our own way to those <laughs> we're just same, catching up to those like, same old things yeah, yeah. Really, it's nothing it's not new but what is new about it is that it's coming from you that's the special thing you know uh, it has in my life taken some some contemplative you know looking in into what's going on in my head and my emotions and being an honest examiner of the poor character that's in there honestly examining it and figuring out what have i squashed what circle thing have i squashed into a square a square box uh, you know is that square peg in a round hole i got the i said it backwards yeah, but yeah. you know what what yeah. things have i squashed uh, what bitterness am I holding on to that's keeping me from uh, this making me clam up and be reserved instead of genuine? Yeah, because yeah. being genuine is really at the heart of creativity. We're trying to get, we're trying to exist. We're trying to get our insides visible in some way. And so if you're not genuine, then what in the world are you trying to get out there? There's no sense to be made of that for me. So genuine is a key component. Figure out how to be genuine and understand that it's not an instant. It's not an instant choice. You got to work at figuring out the genuine you. I mean, we're both married, right? So this will this will make perfect sense. A lot of times the problem is not the other person. The problem is you, you know? <laughs> That's it. And if you do get it all figured out that the problem is the other person, well, there's nowhere to go from there anyway. So... Yeah, like what are you going to change at that point? You're not going to change them. Yeah. I mean, just consider the possibility that the problem might be you. <laughs> you know, that's it. And and because that's where you have ability to change. That's where you have power to change things. 